We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1. Paul here has some encouraging words uh, that Timothy needed, and I would argue we need now more than ever, especially considering uh, this cultural moment. So let's look at verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, which some would say is now, right? And really, even Paul believed then was later times. Anytime it's after uh, the ascension of Jesus, after he lived the life, died, rose again, but then went to heaven, between that point and the second coming of Jesus, every generation has believed they're the last generation. We are no exception. I would argue every generation has signs, or it's like we're clearly the last one, but we've all believed that. So maybe we are, maybe we're not. But explicitly says, and I would say as each time goes by, we can say more and more, we fall into this category. In later times, what? Some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared, they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. Verse 4. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified or made holy by the word of God and by prayer. Then he kind of takes a churn here in verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, remember, Paul is a pastor talking to another pastor here. And he says, okay, pastor, if you point these things out, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Nourished, underline the word, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. But have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. We still have those in today's world. Rather, train yourself in godliness. For the training, if you've been around Passion Creek anytime, you know we love training. We're going to talk about that a lot tonight. For the training of the body, actual physical body, has limited benefit. It is good, but godliness is beneficial in every single way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Just two more verses. Again, Paul says this a lot. It's a pastor saying, you need to say amen to this. You need to tweet this. He says, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. This should lead to anticipation. What is verse 10 going to say? It says, for this reason, we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people. And I love this line, especially of those who believe. The title of tonight's message is Marching Forth on November 4th. Marching Forth on November 4th. Let's pray. Father, I ask you that you just continue to uh, bless our congregation. I know, Lord, that some um, are staying at home online tonight because uh, they are not feeling well, and I'm just so grateful for their um, being cautious. I pray that you protect us. I pray that you would keep the rest of us healthy. Pray, Lord, that those who are not feeling well, I pray that they would recover. Um, God, I just ask you that tonight we would open our hearts to you. We are in a time in our nation uh, that has a lot of division, a lot of anticipation in the next few days. And God, I really think a lot of people today have a November 3rd faith putting their hope and excitement or dread in what happens on November 3rd. And so, God, I pray that tonight we'd be reminded that we have a November 4th faith, Lord, that we know we can wake up on Wednesday with hope, with courage, knowing that ultimately, God, you are still on your throne, and we're here to worship you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, everybody says, Amen. 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 I wanted to title the message March 4th on November 4th. You get it? It's a pun. It's amazing, but whatever. So marching forth on November 4th. In other words, we as the church, no matter what, we still have a mission to do, no matter what happens with the election results. John Piper, he recently wrote an article on Desiring God. Some, some of us, I have mixed feelings about Piper as a general rule. I love him. I've been so grateful for his life and his ministry. He recently wrote an article, and to be honest, I didn't come to the same conclusions that he came to at the end of his article, but it didn't make me think a lot. And one quote he had in there was very um, helpful for me as a pastor, and it's made me think and reflect a lot, especially for tonight's message. It says this on his article. He says, may I suggest, again, John Piper is a, is a retired pastor. He's written like a million books. He's really well respected. He, say, he said, may I suggest to pastors that in the quietness of your study, you do this. Imagine that America collapses. First anarchy, then tyranny. From the right or the left. 
Now, this is not a fun exercise, okay? Let me just say that. Imagine that religious freedom is gone. Next slide. What remains for Christians is fines, prison, exile, and martyrdom. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Amen. Just so much excitement. All right. Then ask yourself this. Here's where I want to get to. Has my preaching, and don't answer this out loud, okay, but has my preaching been developing real radical Christians? The reality is I'm a little bit nervous the way that we are as a church nationwide. It's almost like we're very much relying on the results on Tuesday. But I think we need to ask ourselves, is our apprenticeship to Jesus so, sure, you can blame me and Pastor Caleb, but also there needs to be some ownership for yourself as well. Is your apprenticeship to Jesus developing you to become a real, radical, and I would add resilient Christian? Again, I've been burdened that I think we are setting ourselves up to be crushed. We have a lot of dramatic language of doom and gloom. That's what gets the most clicks. That's what gets most people to come. But the more and more I see it, the more and more I can't help but think this is so antithetical to the way of Jesus. Jesus, did never, he never fueled the fire of fear. He always came forth with love and hope for a brighter future. So again, I want to be clear tonight. I am concerned about the outcome of this election. I am praying for it. I am voting on Tuesday. But also, I'm almost, I think I'm more deeply concerned about the church and our outlook after the election. Again, we ought to pray for the outcome of this election, but we also ought to pray for our outlook after the election. Questions like, can we still love our neighbor who voted for the other candidate? Can we wake up with joy and hope on November 4th if our candidate lost on November 3rd? I think these are the questions that I think would really, I think the outside world is watching to see if we can actually answer these questions with a wholehearted yes. I will still love, I will still have joy, I will still have hope. And I think here in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and following, Paul gives us an outline, I would say, what it looks like to be a real radical and resilient follower of Jesus. So let's zero in again on verse 1. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. How? Paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. In other words, these false teachers really don't have any guilt. They know they're lying, but they have no problem propagating these lies because they benefit from said lies. What do they do? They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected, look, if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Again, this word, depart from the faith, even in Ephesus during this time, there were some people who were a part of the church, and they were following the way of Jesus, but then they got caught up in the drama of the day, the new cycle of the day, and they found themselves weaning themselves off. To be honest, we have seen that in our world today. I have friends who used to be followers of the way, and they got caught up so much into what everybody, all these false teachers are saying, that they found themselves maybe not even directly saying, I'm not following the way, but they're not practicing the way of Jesus in a continual basis. And it, and it worries me as a pastor to make sure what we need to do in this moment is to really call out the false teaching and make sure that we're all in this together and helping each other out. And so what you have in verse 1 through 5 is what false teachers always use this. You see it used in Ephesus and 1 Timothy, but you also see it used today. And I want to call it the predictable pickle. You guys, anybody baseball fans? I am not, but my favorite part, it's like when you're at NASCAR, you like, you almost want them to wreck because it's finally something fun to watch. Anybody, right? No, just me. I, I feel terrible. I'm like, I don't want anybody to die or even like sub a toe, but please, I want to see cars flip. You know what I'm saying? So in baseball, it's around the same thing. I want to see a bunch of home runs and give me like at least one pickle. And the pickle is when the, the runner is between second and third base and the guy's got the ball and they're trying to psych him out, you know? And so the runner's all going like this and like, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over there. And you're just like, what's going to happen, right? And so those are my favorite times as a baseball player. I was shortstop, so I always got caught, and I would always juke people out. Anyways, uh, I usually win, Jordan. Just, just know that. So it's this pickle where you think 
You have to choose one side or the other, and you're pressured for you to get safe. You have to find which side is best for you. Well, in all false teaching, there are pickles that, that the enemy, de demonic teaching, it literally says that in verse 1, teachings of demons, they try to get you caught up in a pickle. And here's the two pickles we find ourselves in. They either tell you, okay, you have to figure it out. You hear about the gospel, and now you must receive and enjoy anything. You learn about grace, right? You learn about love. And so now the false teacher says, it's all grace and love. So just do whatever you want. But then you have another side of false teachers where they say, no, no, no. What you're supposed to do when you hear about the truth is now you must reject and endure everything. Everything is bad. Everything is miserable, right? And so really what you have, you see this all throughout church history. This one, uh, receive anything, is antinomianism. That's a theological phrase of essentially saying exactly that, that there's false teachers that say any law, any rules, you don't have to obey it all. That is so Old Testament. Jesus died and forgave you. You can do whatever you want. And so it makes people think, I guess I can do that. Other false teachers, they get you in this pickle by saying, no, the Bible is all about, look, Jesus died for you, but you must be worthy of him dying for you. You must follow the truth. You can't have any fun. You can't do you, boo, right? You have to reject and be miserable until heaven. And so a lot of us, we hear one false teacher, you can do anything. Other false teachers, you can't do anything. And we find ourselves in this pickle. And here in Ephesus, the false teachers were really pushing. Um, again, this is antinomianism. The one that rejects everything is called Asceticism. Asceticism is, I will be miserable, therefore I will be holy. You have the church in Ephesus, they actually believed asceticism. They started to believe marriage was bad and food was bad. They couldn't even enjoy what I would say are like the two greatest blessings on this earth, right? Food and the wife, you know? And those are the two things the false teachers were saying, those are bad. And I'd be like, I am done with this church, right? There's got to be another way. And so the false teachers, here's what they do. They get you to think you have to pick one of those two options, either receive and enjoy anything or reject and endure everything. Well, the reality is we don't even have to play that game at all because the Bible says we're to receive things that should be received and we're to reject things that should be rejected. It's actually a whole lot easier. But false teachers, the demonic realm tries to make you think you have to either pick receive anything or reject everything. And you have to find which one seems the best to you. And it winds up leading to misery. It winds up leading to all sorts of issues. So Paul is addressing that in 4, 1 through 5. Don't get caught up in this predictable pickle. And know that good things are good things and bad things are bad things. To re apply this to us today, I just want to speak a word into this. I think today we're caught up in what I will call a political pickle. We are in a political pickle, and here's the pickle that society wants you to believe you have to pick one or the other. And I'm here to say, <laughs> no, we do all four, okay? So the first one that throughout history, the church has... When, okay, when the church is at its best and the witness is at its strongest and it's fallen the way of Jesus, they are unapologetically pro-life. From womb to the tomb, we believe at conception that this is a human life, that God has a plan and purpose for them. And so pro-life doesn't just mean you have a stance. It means you're actually putting forth effort and finances to help those who are put in bad positions where they have to even figure out if they should have an abortion or not. Again, we are praying. I'm grateful for our, our recent Supreme Court justice. We're praying that Roe v. Wade does get overturned, right? And so we are, we are pro-life unapologetic about that. The next part that a lot of people I think in this room would also agree with, right, is biblical marriage and sexuality. In other words, there is one man and one woman for marriage, and we believe God made man to be man and for woman to be woman. This is not super pop. Neither of these in certain circles are not popular today. But again, we're here to follow the truth, not what people say is the truth, right? And so this is why it's helpful that we tether ourselves to the word of God each and every week uh, to learn what God has to say. And so we believe that. And again, in certain circles, that's not a fun thing to say. You're going to get made fun of, but we're again unapologetic. Here's the third thing. Again, throughout history, when the church is at its best, we completely believe and agree we're actually the one leading the way in rac racial reconciliation. 
We believe this. We believe all throughout the Bible. It talks about how there's no Greek nor Jew. There is unity because of the blood of Jesus, right? And so we are on the forefront in making sure that everybody feels at home, that we are willing to sacrifice some things in order for the greater good of our community. And so really, the church should be dramatically diverse. We should be leading the way in these answers. And again, I will say, we obviously have some sort of problem here. This is a huge issue today. Now, the way people are solving it, I have a lot of issues with, but it certainly is a problem. The next one, the fourth one, that again, they want you to think this is a political pickle, but we've always cared for the poor. You could also add the marginalized. We as a church, we love the poor. We care for them. We find ways to not only just give them food for the day, but to set themselves up to where they can work and they can provide and they can be a good citizen, um, both here and on earth, but also in heaven. Now, Politics wants to put us in a pickle that says, I don't agree, I don't believe this, but politics tries to get us convinced that these first two are conservative values and on the right, and these next two are liberal values and on the left. Politics wants you to believe you can't believe in all four. Like it's a pickle. You have to run and pick. Do I pick these two or do I pick those two? And a lot of us, we find ourselves, well, killing sounds terrible, right? And so we just find ourselves picking the first two. And I think when we do that, we are letting the enemy win. As the church, we have always been about all four. Unapologetically, a simple reading of the gospel says we are all four. There is no way you can spin it. God deeply cares for the flourishing of all of mankind. Shalom, God created us to have all of these things in action. And so it's important for us to see, but here's the thing, and, and I will admit this, a lot of us, and I'll move on, but I think this is really important. I think what we do is we look at society's answers for these things let me put it this way. For me personally, I have denied critical problems because I despise political solutions to those problems. Does that make sense? So I'm finding myself being against the problem when really what I'm against is their solution. And we as the church should get more creative and bring about an actual solution that brings forth gospel flourishing full diversity, everyone joining together, nobody pushing each other down, but everyone lifting each other up. Make sense? Amen. Yeah, you with me? So we need to be careful here. We Woe to us because we get caught in this political pickle and we're like, yeah, we're just these two. Yeah, right? No, no, no. We are all four because that was the kingdom of God doesn't have to pick a side. We pick the truth. I think this is a warning to all of us they found themselves in this, pull, in this pickle as well of thinking they have to pick one against the other. Here is what I think is really important for us to reflect on. Next point. Our witness is weak and fickle when we fall for this political pickle. When we think that these two are against those two, we wind up missing out on so many people hearing the good, good news of Jesus. Because we hear, they hear how God loves everyone, but then we say, oh, but not those people. That message doesn't coincide. We are hypocrites, and they don't want anything to do with the way of Jesus. So it's important, again, not to fall into the world's categories. A basic understanding of Christian orthodoxy and church history knows the church has always been radically pro-life and against infanticide. The, the church has always been radical in their sexuality and, and only having sex after marriage. We're the weirdos, right? We've always been the weirdos. It's amazing, okay? The church has always been not just for ra racial reconciliation, but we've been leading the way. Not always, but we should be. And we've always, in general, cared for the poor and the marginalized. I encourage you, if you struggle with that, read the Gospels this week and notice how Jesus constantly did not care about tribalism or categories. He said the truth, and he did not care which tribe approved. So sometimes he would say things that the Pharisees loved, other times he would say things that the tax collectors loved. Other times he would say things that the scribes loved, but then vice the other way. A lot of times he would say the things that the Pharisees hated. He said things the tax collectors hated. He said things that the scribes hated because he just went with the truth and he didn't first preconceive, okay, which side is this? Which category is this? Does that make sense? 
It's very important for us just to stick with the truth. And sometimes you'll be labeled something that you actually are not. And you're in good company because Jesus got that happening to him all the time. Let us stand for the truth. Scott Sauls, he has this quote. It's not on the screen because I'm a little uncomfortable even with the quote to put it on the screen. But it's making me think a lot. He says, Jesus, in many ways, Jesus is more conservative than the far right. But Jesus is also in many ways more liberal than the far left. What does that mean? He didn't care about categories. He just stuck with the truth. And sometimes a broken clock is right, you know, what is it, twice a day, right? So sometimes it looks like they're right or whatever. I don't care. I am picking the truth of the kingdom. And whichever way you categorize it, categorize me however you like, right? I think this will dramatically help our witness. If we pick and choose what to follow, we have a faith that's fake and hollow. If we pick and choose what to follow because it's a right side or the left side, we wind up having a faith that's fake and hollow and it is not pleasing or beautiful to anybody and we wind up losing our oomph for evangelism. Now, the way of Jesus doesn't fall for this pickle. We declare truth to be truth and falsehood to be falsehood. But that means we must know our Bibles. Amen? So let's keep reading it. Okay, let's look at verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ. I love that. It's like, okay, God, if I just teach your word every week, you call me good. I love it, okay? Nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Notice the pastor, the Christian leader. They have to not only be teaching the truth, but they themselves need to follow the truth. We ought not just be speaking the truth, but we must be living the truth as well. Write this down. Our souls, I'm in a rhyming mood again. It's been a while, guys, so you're welcome, but whatever. Our souls will stay fickle when our ears remain tickled. It works, though. Come on. It works. This week, I've been so good. I've been like really minimizing it because I got tired of you guys making fun of me. But I was like, forget it. I am doing it this week because I love the word fickle, tickle, nickel. I mean, I had even more, but I, okay, anyways, back to the truth. Second, you do, yeah, thank you. I do me, okay? That's the lie of antinomianism, but it's fine. Okay, so uh, next scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 3. 2 Timothy, not first. This is where I get this truth. It says, for the time will come, it's now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, fickle, right? They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. It is easier now more than ever for you to pick whichever preacher you want to listen to. Um, pick us. Okay, right? It's really easy to do that. Okay. Go back to that point. Our, no, you're so good. Our souls will stay fickle if our ears remain tickled. I read Jeremiah 23 this morning. I didn't plan this, but I was reading it in, my, in the Word. Jeremiah is such a good book for right now. And it was literally, I felt like it was such a word to me. It was essentially saying, preachers, you have to preach the truth no matter what. And the reality is stubborn hearts. Guys, I get emails, Right? When I preach the truth, I get emails, and they're not fun to read, right? Uh, send me good emails, then I'll like emails again, you know what I'm saying? But it is easy to fall into this, even me, and say, well, I just won't, I maybe won't include the whole truth here. Friends, we need the whole truth, one that really hurts. And that's why I think we have in verse 7, he talks about training. He says, but have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train. This is hard. This hurts and it involves a lot of sweat, right? Train yourself in godliness. Verse 8, for the training of the body has limited benefit, but... Godliness is beneficial in every way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This training word is the allusion to the Olympics. And yes, the Olympics were still happening way back then. They knew this, this, re, this required a whole life dedication. This was a lot of sweat. This was a lot of dedication. This was, your, well, this was everything. It's all about training. And that's not something we want to hear. This last week I was on my run. And uh, I, I do weird things. I usually just pray out loud, but sometimes I sing very rarely. It's like when I'm in the middle of a field and I know nobody's around, then I sing. Okay, so I'm singing. And do you guys remember that song, Let It Rain? 
from way back in the day. You know what I'm saying? And I was just like, let it rain, let it rain. Now I just started like getting open the floodgates of hell. You know that song? Now you do, right? And so I was just singing it. And I feel like the Holy Spirit's like, verse two should have been, let us train. But we don't like that, right? That song would not sell as much. But the reality is in this moment, what we need is the reign of God. We need revival, but we also need reformation. We need us to step up and start doing the training ourselves. St. Augustine put it this way, without God, we can't. But without us, God won't. Hear me, without God, we can't. And I love that part, because I say, God, I can't do this without you. But at the very same time, the way God does things, without us, if we don't train, if we don't put ourselves in those positions to be a blessing, God won't. He won't bring down that fire. And I wonder, we've been praying for fire, and he's like, but you haven't created the environment where I can trust you with my fire. This is what we as the church must do. So let me give you three exhortations on what training looks like here at Passion Creek Church. We're passionate about this. If you've been around us in any length of time, you probably heard all three of these points. Hear them again. You need them, okay? Number one, our training isn't measured by distance, but duration. This was a game changer for me. When we talk about reading your Bible, don't even, this next year, don't make it about reading the Bible in a year, which I hope you can pull off. Make it about reading your Bible 15 minutes a day. You will actually read your whole Bible sooner when you do it that way. It's about duration. That's why you hear a lot at our church. We say, here's what we want you to do. Involve yourself in God time, gather time, group time, and go time. God time, time alone with the Lord every single day. Gather time, you're doing it right now, here or even online. Group time, meeting in groups. We have groups that meet almost every day of the week. And go time, this is the one we're really gonna emphasize this next year. How do we share our faith? How do we get involved? And the biggest thing is we're not in charge of our transformation, but in a very real way, we're in charge of our time. So God, I don't know how you're gonna change me, but I'm gonna give you the time so you can change me. Does that make sense? How do we expect transformation if we don't give him our time? Thomas Dubay, in a book, Fire Within, he says, the most serious spiritual growth is often discerned by the believer as backsliding. Let me say it again. The most serious spiritual growth is often discerned by the believer as backsliding. Friends, when we try to determine if we're growing, it is very hard and can get very discouraging. But when we just say, God, I've been showing up every day and reading your word every day and praying every day. I've done my part. Without us, without God, we can't. But without us, God won't. Henry Nowen, this is one more illustration I think is so helpful. He likens it as you're getting in a car and you're on a, going on a road trip and you're so excited for your destination. A lot of us, we, we picture the destination is that the picture of us being this amazing Christian, right? But he says, don't get, don't get discouraged when it feels like you're not making forward progress. He says, look at it like you're in the car and all God has done is he's allowed you to take a pit stop to look at the scenery. You're not actually backsliding. What God is doing in your life, he wants you actually to enjoy this moment. Because a lot of times it's not even about forward progress. It's just about sitting in his presence. And sometimes it's not forward growth, but it's good to get out of the car and breathe the fresh air. Our training isn't measured by distance. We're not here, are you going further, right? That's why like I love and hate Awanas because it's about like I got more medals than you. I've memorized more than you, amen, right? It's about duration, Okay, here's the next thing we talk about with training. We train by counterattacking the suggestions of the enemy. Thomas A. Kempis says, it is the sign of a weak soul to be led on by suggestions of the enemy. There's three ways I would say that we are led on by the suggestions of the enemy. Number one, we counterattack, well, this is what we do against it. We counterattack condemnation from our past. One of the biggest ways the enemy is trying to attack you right now is reminding you of how terrible you have been. And here at our church, we don't run from it. We deal with it and apply the blood of Jesus to it. We actually talk about our past and let God work on it. Pete Scazzaro, he has a great book about emotionally healthy spirituality. He says this all the time. He says, Jesus is in your heart, but grandpa is in your bones. So there's a lot of stuff in your past 
A lot of stuff in your genealogy that you have to surrender to the Father and not allow the enemy to use it to hold it over you. The second thing under counterattacking the suggestions of the enemy, we counterattack temptation in the present. We see temptations as actually an opportunity to recognize, oh wait, I am grabbing for something because my soul needs something more. <gasps> Jesus is better. This is actually a sign my soul is craving more of the presence of the Lord. So I'm not going to give in to this cheap desire because this is actually an invitation to a deeper desire. The devil hates when you do that, right? He'd rather you just give in to that temptation. The third way we attack is we counterattack speculations about our future. I need to be quick because we have more to go to, but essentially, a lot of us are fearing tomorrow. We're fearing Tuesday, right? We counterattack that by saying, you know what? I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know that God will give me what I need in that moment, so I'm just going to deal with what I have today because there's enough worries of today. Jesus said that in Matthew. Go check it out. Now, third thing on training, and we'll be done with the training part. We train by exposing our false selves to grow into our full selves. Here at our church, when we talk about training, we actually want to talk about our sin. We want to talk about our propensity towards the evil things of the world, and it's good for us to confess that in order for us to be freed from it. A lot of us, you'll see today, people are panicking because they put their hope in three things. The false self always puts their hope in three things. Number one, you believe in your false self, which means apart from Christ, living in a world of sin, not trusting him. Number one, we put our hope in what we can have. That's why people are working, trying to get as many possessions as possible. Number two, we put our hope in what we can do. That's why we're trying to get better at everything. We think finally we'll be happy once I'm better than everybody else. And number three, we put our hope in what others think of us. That's why some of us have fear. We're paralyzed speaking the truth because what if they say this about me? The false self is constantly worrying about what you can have, what you can do, and what others think of you. And Jesus Jesus can break you free from that trap altogether because he has all we need. He's already done what we needed to do. He thinks highly of me. God says, I am his child. We're good. Revelation 317, and I'll hurry. Oh, okay. Jesus is talking to the church in Laodicea, and he says this. He says, for you say, I'm rich. I become wealthy, and I need nothing. And you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This is Jesus. That's savage. Okay, that's what they call that, right? The false self gets you to believe, I'm good. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I don't need anything. But the truth is, you are empty inside. You know what we train about? We try to remind you, you're empty inside. No, I'm just kidding. We see that when we give that over is when Christ fills us up. Look at verse 20. This is the hope. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He said, if you surrender to me, quit looking for all these other things and allow me to enter into every area of your life, you will be fulfilled. We're going to have food. It's going to be a great time. Right? This is what we do. We train. We expose all those, the false self in order for us to grow into our full selves. Robert Mulholland on The Deeper Journey, he has this quote about this. I'm going to hit this TV. Okay, this is so good. I want you to examine your heart right now with all the politics. I don't know if you noticed, right? All this stuff, look at this. He's talking about ways that we can, things to surrender. He say, what should we surrender? It may be a habit that holds us in its destructive bondage. Maybe for you, it's an attitude that deforms our way of living. This is a big one. What if it's a perception that warps our view of others? A pattern of relationships with others that is destructive both to them and us. We got more to repent of. Look, a way of reacting to circumstances that hinders us on November 4th, right? A cancerous resentment whose poison is eating away the vitals of our being. The false self, when you fully run after those things, that's what it leads to. And so we are training. We know we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the Lord I love. And we don't want to give in to those pickles. So again, we ask you really to join our covenant family and join us as we continue to train and fight against the flesh, fight, fight against the suggestions of the enemy. And we do it just by giving God our time. Okay, let me conclude. 
How do we march forth on November 4th? Again, I want us to see one through five. We don't fall for this pickle. We call truth, truth, and lie a lie. We don't even play the game that the false teachers want us to play to begin with. Verse six through eight, we really, really fortify that by training. We hold on to the nourishing of the Bible. We listen to each other. We approach humility. We know we don't have this thing figured out. We know there's always more to confess, but there's also always more to enjoy in Christ. And verse nine is like the whammo that's so good. He even says in verse 9, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. in verse 10. For this reason, we labor and strive. Other translations actually say agonize. Because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. I was very confused. Why does Paul say especially those who believe? believe. I think the reality is, I think what we need to remember, especially in this season right now, when we communicate a Savior, which our world needs to hear about, we say at the end of the day, I am preaching what I need the most. We are not talking about a Jesus that we've graduated from, right? We're talking about a Jesus that we still need that we are still so prone to fall and God has so much grace for us. We need his grace to sustain us. Here's the last point. And I hope this is encouraging for you for Wednesday. Look, we are not in the world for Christ. That sounds heretical, right? We are not in the world for Christ, why? We are in Christ for the world. I want you to notice how that changes everything. See, if we are in the world for Christ, we would just read verse 10, for this reason we labor and strive because we put our hope in, in God because he is the savior of you guys. He saved you. So I'm here to be his herald and make sure that you're saved. But instead he says, no, no, no. We're here to proclaim a savior that even we need the most. We, are, we have not graduated from this. Look, we are not in the world for Christ. We are in Christ for the world. My life changed when I stopped telling Jesus, okay, Jesus, Hold my hand, we're gonna get them, right? Me and you, baby, we got this. My life changed when I said, God, I need you to show up. I need you to show off. I can't really do much of anything, but I am going to put myself and make myself available for you to use me. But if it's up to me, this thing ain't gonna work, God. We are not in the world for Christ. We are in Christ for the world. Pastoring got a lot easier for me. When I stopped telling God, what to do for my church. And I stopped, I started asking God, God, what do you want me to do for your church? What are you looking to do here? Because it's yours. We get so caught up, I think, what's happening in politics, because we think this better be a better situation or it's going to be really hard to be for Christ. And the reality is we're praying for a better situation, but at the end of the day, we're in Christ for the world. Christ is going to do this for us. Thomas A. Kempis, he has this quote, and it just rocked me this week. He says, to carry the cross, to love the cross, to chastise the body and bring it to subjection, to flee honors, to endure contempt gladly, which we're going to go through these things probably soon, right? To despise self and wish to be despised, to suffer any adversity and loss, to desire no prosperous days on earth. This is not man's way. If you rely upon yourself, if you are in the world for Christ, right? You can do none of these things. But if you trust in the Lord, strength will be given you from heaven and the world and the flesh will be made subject to your word. You will not even fear your enemy, the devil, if you are armed with faith and signed with the cross of Christ. What if we actually knew we are not in the world for Christ? We are in Christ for the world. We're protected because we're in him. 
Last thing, my, my wife, she's been reading biographies and uh, I've been really inspired by it. And one of them is Corey Ten Boom. So I started to share with her everything I knew about her. And then she showed me up because I apparently don't know enough because she knew a lot more. But what's cool about her, she was a Dutch Christian that was actually put in the imprisoned camp for protecting the Jews against the Nazis. So again, she wasn't a Jew herself, but because she was protecting the Jews, she was put into the prison camp with the rest of them. Well, Corey Tim Boom and her sister Betsy, they were forced, when they were thrown into this imprisoned camp, they were forced to be uh, sleep on what we would call soiled straw beds that were full of fleas. So again, they were put in this situation because they believed in God and they were trying to protect God's people. And so Corey reacted like most of us. She was disgusted. She said, God, why would you do that? We're doing so much for you and our bed is full of fleas. Betsy, her sister, started quoting 1 Thessalonians. She said, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So again, Corey's like, you little, you know what I'm saying? Like the sister just showing us all up, right? So frustrating, right? And then things got silent. And then Betsy said, thank you, God, for these fleas. And she went to sleep. Corey wrote in her book, I could not get myself to thank God for these fleas. So they went on to endure much suffering at the hands of the guards. They were humiliated, oftentimes stripped naked. They were forced to work so much that literally Betsy got to the point where she didn't even have the strength to stand up. And again, this was all because they, they were doing this for Christ. They didn't have to be there, but they stood for the truth. But one thing that was strange to them the guards always left them alone at night. This enabled them actually to read their contraband Bible, it allowed them to finally have moments of peace and privacy and for them to grieve together. And gratefully, it actually took them from opportunities of getting raped, which they've heard happened in many of the other rooms. So one day they found out why they were always left alone. The guards couldn't stand those fleas. And finally, Corey Ten Boom said, God, I thank you for these fleas. We don't know what Wednesday will bring. If we were in the world for Christ, it would be kind of terrifying because we need to have a lot of strength to pull this thing off. But if we are in Christ for the world, we can say, God, I praise you for our president. I praise you for our nation. I praise you for our politics. And I might not know why or how, but I thank you because you know how. And I'm not the one who has to figure out these solutions anyways. My job is to be in Christ. And Christ will do what only he can do for the world. May we march forth on November 4th with more hope and joy than ever before because of that truth. Corey Tim Boom, one of my favorite quotes of hers, because it rhymes. It says, if you look to the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at God, you'll be at rest. Will you look at God with me on Wednesday morning? It is so much better than the alternative.